one of the most colorful characters in the Old Testament who was a wonderful leader is a man by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah found himself in exile with the Old Testament Jewish people when God called him to leave the cushy job that he had and to return to Jerusalem to lead out in the effort of rebuilding the walls around that city. Now that was a very formidable task. Because not only did Nehemiah have to rebuild that wall, but he had to do it in the midst of a lot of opposition. There were enemies that set themselves against him and against that effort that he had to withstand. By name, Sanballat the Samaritan and Tobias the Ammonite determined that the wall should not be rebuilt and that Nehemiah should be thwarted in his efforts. And so they led raids to destroy this work. They even had influence on some of Nehemiah's fellow Jews, causing them to start questioning his leadership. But Nehemiah was undeterred, and he gave himself to the work. He divided those who served with him into two parties. One was given primarily to the work of construction, and the other was given primarily to watch out and to be ready to engage in battle by keeping the enemies away. And even the men who worked the construction site would carry their tools for work in one hand and a sword in the other, or a sword strapped to their side on the other hand. When the people became afraid and started to wonder if indeed the wall could be built, Nehemiah encouraged them with these words found in chapter 4 of this book. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And with that vision before them, ultimately the wall was rebuilt and it only took 52 days. But it didn't happen without genuine zeal for the Lord and without a willingness to stand against enemies even to the point of bloodshed. Nehemiah epitomizes what is necessary for every faithful gospel minister. Anyone who would serve Christ in his church needs to be willing to engage in the work of building up and fighting off for the glory of God. The 19th century Baptist pastor Charles Spurgeon understood this very well and he took Nehemiah and the tools that Nehemiah had his work crew employ as symbols of his own ministry. And so he started a publication that he called The Sword and the Trowel. The sword for fighting off the enemies of the Lord and the trowel for building up the church of the Lord. And any faithful ministry of the gospel will have this same orientation. Opposing enemies, building up the church, all for the glory of the Lord. That's precisely what we see in the Apostle Paul. We see it in the way that he engages and expresses his great concerns as a servant in dealing with the problems of the church at Corinth. Paul had started that church. In his missionary travels, he came to the city and he preached the gospel. And people believed the gospel. They were converted to Jesus Christ. And then doing what Christians do, they united themselves together to form a church of Jesus Christ. Sometime after Paul left that church, some smooth-talking, persuasive, false teachers began to infiltrate it. They began to lead the members astray. And they did so by questioning Paul's authority as an apostle, his effectiveness as an apostle, and they created quite a division in the church with their murmurings against him. Well, Paul had to respond. He had to engage this new challenge. And he did so by paying them a brief visit that was somewhat confrontational, and then writing them letters, one of which was a very severe letter, sending Titus to take that letter and to check up on them. And then he writes what we call 2 Corinthians in our Bibles, after Titus had returned from Corinth to give a report to Paul that most of the church had repented at his admonitions calling them to account for their sins. 
They repented for being led astray by these false teachers. Now we've been studying this letter of 2 Corinthians for the last several months. And this morning we come to chapter 10, which is the beginning of the last section of the letter. Chapters 10, 11, 12, and 13 find Paul returning specifically to a defense of his ministry as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he defends his ministry by taking aim directly at these false teachers that had come into the church and were making accusations against him. As we look at chapter 10 today, we're going to see that Paul expresses his ministry in terms of three concerns that every gospel ministry must have if it's going to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Those concerns are fighting against worldliness, building up the church, and boasting only in the Lord. Our text is the whole chapter, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 18. If you're using one of the Bibles that we provide, it's found on page 968, 969. I encourage you to open the Bible, follow along as I read, because I'm just going to be talking through these verses and pointing out things, and if you have it in front of you, then you'll be able to follow along and understand far better than if you try to do this without a Bible open in front of you. So hear God's Word. I'm going to read the chapter for us to get it before us so that we can then Consider what the Lord's saying to us from this place in his word today. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I'm away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he's Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits. But will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it's not the one who commends himself who's approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. A faithful gospel ministry will concern itself with the world, the church, and the glory of God. The Apostle Paul shows us this in this chapter. Specifically, such a ministry will stand against the world's strongholds. It will stand for the church's welfare. And it will stand for and boast only in the glory of the Lord. If you want a simple outline of this 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians, you can find it by dividing it into the three paragraphs that we see in our English Bibles. That first paragraph, verses 1 through 6, we could call battling the world. In verses 7 through 12, the second paragraph, building the church. And then that third paragraph, verses 13 through 18, boasting in the Lord. A faithful gospel ministry then will first of all be engaged in battling the world. Paul recognizes what's going on in Corinth. He analyzes the situation in that church theologically. And when he does, 
he realizes that what has happened in the church at Corinth is that a worldly way of thinking has infiltrated the membership there. It has crept in through these false teachers that have come among them. So Paul takes aim at this enemy and he announces his battle plan. He attacks worldliness in the church. Notice how he does it. In verse 1 we see he attacks it with humility. Listen to the way he puts it. Paul, myself entreat you. I myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And then he says, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I'm away. That's one of the accusations that was made against him by these false teachers that sarcastically he is now refuting. He explicitly spells this out in verse 10. Paul is a hand-picked apostle of Jesus Christ. He's, a, he's vested with the authority of Christ. When Christ left the earth and ascended into heaven, He gave to His chosen apostles authority to write Scripture, to represent Him in the world. He could have started this section of His letter by saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus. This is the church of Jesus. And I demand that you act accordingly. But He doesn't do that. Instead of invoking His apostolic authority, He invokes... The humility of Christ. He appeals to Jesus by the meekness and gentleness of Jesus. And we need to keep this in mind as we work through this section because it's vitally important to understand, especially to understand truth about real humility. What humility is, what it isn't. Too often in our day, humility and meekness are equated with weakness. Humility in our day is often judged incompatible with strength, or resolve, or forcefulness. You can be humble or tough. You can be humble or confident. You can be humble or immovable. But we don't consider humility to allow a man to be tough and confident and immovable at the same time. But those thoughts that see those as contrary realities in a person are not biblical thoughts. They do not correspond with what the Bible sets before us as genuine humility. Think with me for just a few minutes. If you know your Old Testament, who was the man designated the most meek man in all the earth? Moses. Moses in Numbers chapter 12 verse 3 is called the meekest man on the face of the earth. Do you know much about Moses? Would anybody consider Moses weak? When Moses was up on the mountain getting the law of God and he comes down with those tablets that God had inscribed with his own finger and he sees the golden calf that the Israelites made and began to worship he takes that calf, he burns it, he grinds it into dust, and then he mixes the dust with water and he tells the people, drink it as a symbol of judgment against them. There's nothing weak about Moses, and yet he's called the meekest man on all the earth. And of course, the epitome of humility and meekness is Jesus himself. The only time that we have recorded in the Gospels that Jesus described himself, he did so with this statement. He says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He shows his gentleness, his lowliness of heart, when as the eternal Son of God who became a man, he willingly lays down his life on the cross in order to pay for the sins of people like you and me. There was nothing outside of himself that compelled him to do that. He could have destroyed his enemies with a look, with a thought. He could have called legions of angels to intervene and wipe out all those who had set themselves against him. And yet in gentleness, in lowliness, he succumbed, he laid down his life on the cross. Jesus, meek, lowly, Jesus, 
one point took a whip and he stood face to face with those money changers in the temple and he drove them out with a whip. Humility is not weakness. Being meek doesn't mean that you roll over and let wrongs go unaddressed. Brothers and sisters, being humble means that you trust God and His Word above your own inclinations. And you do what He says to do rather than what you might otherwise prefer to do because you humbly submit yourself to His authority. This is exactly what we see going on in Paul's life. He humbly, meekly opposes the false teachers and their dangerous false teaching. So along with humility, we see him acting with confidence. With confidence in verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, he describes the, the nature of, of this confidence. He will confront the false teachers with their false accusations boldly and confidently. He calls them out. He says, there are some who accuse him of walking according to the flesh. There are some who think that he is not measuring up to their standards. And in making their accusation, Paul says, they are not operating by the right standards. They misunderstand what true spirituality looks like. And so, taking their false standards of what spirituality looks like, they measure Paul and they say, Paul just doesn't measure up. He's not impressive. His speech is, is not admirable. He doesn't look like much. He's weak. What does Paul do? Paul rejects their accusation outright. And he does so in verse 3 by making a play on words. He says, yeah, I walk in the flesh. In other words, I live a real human life. But he says, not according to the flesh. Do you see that? And he doesn't just say, I don't walk according to the flesh. He says, we don't wage war according to to the flesh. With those words, Paul, in effect, is declaring war upon those that would stand against Christ and Christ's authority and Christ's church. He is letting them know that he sees his life and ministry as warfare. And he boldly sends notice to those who are opposing him of what they can expect to see from him on the battlefield. Specifically, he has no intention of fighting on their terms. He is not going to admit to their standards by which they are judging him that are not God's standards. And so he confronts the false teachers with divine power. Look at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. He says, I'm not going to stoop to your level. I'm not going to go tit for tat with you. I'm not going to engage in innuendo, deceit, and trickery. These are all things that are used to gain an advantage in the world. Paul says, these aren't our weapons. He's completely confident in doing God's work, God's way. And so he relies, he says, on divine power. He will wield the weapons that God has put in his hands and know that God will use those weapons to accomplish his spiritual purposes on earth. So exactly what weapons is he talking about? I mean, what is our spiritual armament? Well, John read earlier from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, where the armor that we are supplied in Christ is spelled out for us. And the weapons of our warfare listed there are truth and righteousness evangelism, faith, salvation, scripture, prayer. That's what God calls us to employ when we engage in spiritual warfare. These weapons, one writer says, are scorned by the world and yet are the most feared by the powers of darkness. Brothers and sisters, it's vitally important that we remember, recognize and remember what our weapons are in spiritual warfare. So often, the church of Jesus Christ has tried to employ weapons of the world in order to stand against the forces of spiritual darkness. Sadly, we're witnessing it again in this presidential election cycle. But we must not be duped. We must remember to see spiritual victories, we must employ spiritual weapons. And they are to be employed against 
spiritual targets. Do you see how Paul describes what he, see, he has in, in mind as he takes up these weapons? He calls them strongholds. Strongholds. What's a stronghold? Well, it was a fortress. It was a rampart. It had been well known to the people at Corinth because they had one right above the city in the mountain above them. It was a place that most significant cities would build out so that if the city was laid siege to, they could resort to it. They could go up into this fortified place that would be difficult for enemy forces to reach them. He says, arguments are what we have in sight. Every lofty opinion raised against God in verse 5. Paul says, I'm taking aim at the real enemies. I'm taking aim and engaging the real battlefield in spiritual warfare. And notice what he says. He does it with complete confidence of absolute victory. He says, to take every thought captive to obey Christ. So with humble confidence, Paul declares war on every false way of thinking and living that is contrary to the way of Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is our war. It's not against people. It's against ideologies. It's against ideas. It's against ways of thinking that are contrary to the way of Christ. We need to be clear and understand what Paul is saying to us here, what he recognizes here. Every unbeliever remains an unbeliever in Christ because he or she has imbibed arguments and opinions that make their rejection of Christ seem right and reasonable. And those opinions, those arguments, those beliefs that they have bought into are like a stronghold that is designed to keep them from knowing God. Now I know that there are some of you here that are unbelievers and I'm grateful that you're here I'm glad you're here but do you understand how the Bible describes your situation the Bible says that you remain an unbeliever because you have figured out ways of thinking you have believed opinions you have bought into arguments that you have just settled into that keep you from bowing to Jesus Christ as Lord this is how God evaluates you Whatever the reasons are that you have in mind to keep you from trusting Christ, the scripture says those are ideological fortresses. And they set you in opposition to God. And it's wrong. And it's dangerous. Spiritually dangerous for your soul. Some of the arguments that provide fortresses for unbelievers are more sophisticated than others. For example, some may have bought into the arguments of atheists that, that sound very imposing. Arguments that would say, how in the world can we believe in an unseen God and, and a creator? Don't we recognize through evolutionary forces that everything ultimately just came from nothing? And when we die, we're just going to go back to nothingness and those arguments can sound fine and be persuasive at points. And so they become a retreat that people go into. Or maybe arguments like, well, you Christians think that you have the only way. And who makes you right? What about Islam and Buddhism and Judaism and, and other isms? And why should we acknowledge your God when it's just one of many gods? And it sounds like an imposing argument on its surface. Or other arguments to say, look at the evil in the world. Do you want me to believe in a God who is sovereign and good? When 49 people get massacred by a madman in Orlando, you want me to believe that there's a God who rules over this world? Those arguments can be imposing on the surface. And some people resort to them and they live in them and they allow them to keep them in unbelief. Maybe you've not imbibed in those specific arguments. But you just figured out a way to live. Maybe you even tip your hat to God. You might do that. Acknowledge, yeah, there's some God out there somewhere, but you really live for yourself. And you think that you've kind of figured out how to get along in life, at least good enough, 
to keep going. And so you, you live for yourself and you're not living for God. You've not delivered over your life to him in submission to him as your creator and your only redeemer through his son. The scripture tells us that until you bring every thought captive to Jesus Christ, to obey Christ, you are missing out on what life is all about and you are living in fortresses that are designed to keep you opposed to God that will ultimately destroy you. Because every moment that you believe this, every moment that you hang out there, every moment you, you allow those things to keep you from the truth, you are breathing the air that God has put in your lungs. You are enjoying the physical life that He extends by keeping your heart beating. You are enjoying the benefits of relationships that He has provided for you. And you say, well, I just don't believe that. Well, that's because you've resorted to your fortress. And you refuse to take note of the most significant fact in all of human history. Which is this. There was a man who walked this earth 2,000 years ago. Who was crucified, dead, buried, who came back from the dead, never to die again. He's alive 2,000 years later. Until you stick that in your pipe and smoke it, you're not going to be able to really deal with reality. Because that fact, that reality changes everything. If that's true, if that's true, then you need to give attention to what the Bible teaches us about that man. If there's a man who was raised from the dead never to die again, then all of your thoughts about reality and how to live and what's right and wrong and good and bad need to be brought into alignment with that most significant truth. And friend, that's why God brought you here today. That's why He's given you the Bible. That's why He gives you opportunity to stop and consider these things. And when you see and consider this truth of a crucified, risen Savior, Jesus Christ, then you'll realize that no matter whatever else you might have believed or thought or resorted to to keep you living the way you've been living, it just doesn't measure up to this one reality that when you acknowledge it, destroys all of those strongholds. That's what Paul says he's aimed at. Scripture calls us to live not in opposition to God with our thoughts that we've figured out to keep us away from Him, but to live in the light of the good news of what He's done for people like us by sending His Son to die on a cross for our sins. What God has done in Christ is the most significant thing in all the world. And until you see that and believe that, then you will not be able to think or live rightly before your Creator. God created us for Himself. What we need he provides. He knows what's best for us. To become rightly related to Him is to turn from ourselves and to trust His Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord. And when we do that, you enter into a lifetime of having your mind progressively, continually renewed so that more and more, all of your thoughts are taken captive and brought into obedience of Christ. They all line up with the reality that we have a crucified risen Savior. We grow in our knowledge of God. It means that our values change. It means our loves change. It means our relationships change. Our choices will change as every thought in every area of life is increasingly brought into captivity to obey Christ as Lord. Well, Paul sees this. As a faithful minister of Jesus Christ, this is what he fights for and it causes him to battle with humility and it causes him to battle with confidence. And in verse 6, we see it causes him to battle with resolve. Resolve. He says, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. He expects the church, for the most part, to comply with his instructions. And if some do not, namely the false teachers, then he will punish their disobedience with apostolic authority. What's he talking about here? He'll call for discipline in the church, for them to be removed from the church as Jesus commands. He will mark them out for what they are, false teachers, unreliable, not to be trusted. 
You see how Paul's resolve is so strong. He wants the church, he wants every member of this church to be brought into a right way of thinking under the Lordship of Christ. He wants every one of them to reject worldly ways of making judgments and evaluations as they submit their thoughts to obey Christ. What an incredible vision of a church. Let me just ask you, brothers and sisters, is this your vision for Grace Baptist Church? Is this what you want for this body of believers that every one of us will have all of our thoughts brought under the Lordship of Christ, taken captive by Christ to obey Him, to stand against worldliness, to resist every influence to try to help to, to, to ensnare us to make judgments that are on the same basis that unbelievers use to make judgments. We must, like Paul, be willing to engage in battling the world. Secondly, Paul teaches us that a faithful gospel ministry will be involved in building the church. We see this in verses 7 through 12. And then he just kind of circles back around to it in verse 18. In this paragraph, Paul reminds the Corinthians that Christ made him an apostle for the purpose of their spiritual welfare. To build them up, not to destroy them. A faithful ministry always seeks to build up the church of Jesus Christ. Remembering to whom that church belongs. In verse 7. Look what's before your eyes, he writes. If anyone's confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. Now Paul chides them. He, chides, he says, just stop and think. It's right before your eyes. You claim that you're Christ. Well, so am I. And they think that, well, because we're Christ, we have Christ, we can make these judgments, we can render these opinions, and people ought to submit to them. These false teachers claim to belong to Christ, but they want to downplay that Paul the Apostle makes that same claim. Brothers and sisters, we need to beware of people that would come into a church and then in the name of following Jesus and being true to Him, begin teaching things and advocating practices that are disruptive. And they very often will do this by justifying their opinions, justifying their practices. Well, I'm just doing what Jesus has taught me. I'm just doing what He has commanded me to do. Remember that every Christian belongs to Christ. And remember that Christ is the one who has given leaders to the church who also belong to Christ. If the Corinthians had not been so quick to forget that Paul belonged to Christ, that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ, they would have not been so quickly and easily led astray by these false teachers who came in and who in reality were opposing Christ. Every true local church belongs to Jesus. He's the head of it. And no true follower of Christ should sit idly by when interlopers come in and by their teachings and actions begin to undermine the authority that Christ established in his church. Paul reminds them of this. He also wants to remind them of how Christ exercises his authority in the church. Paul is unashamed of his authority as an apostle. He tells us this in verse 8. He rejects the accusations that they make against him that he's inconsistent in wielding this authority. They, in verse 10, accuse him of being a paper tiger and a personal coward. For they say, he writes, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Paul says, I'm the same in writing that I am in person. And what I say when I write is what I'm going to say when I show up. I will speak, whether by writing or personally, depending upon what is needed at the moment. Now he quickly adds in verse 9, I'm not writing to scare you. So I'm not trying to intimidate you with my words, but he says, don't expect me to hold back when I'm with you in person, in verse 11. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to me, these people would accuse Paul of being a coward on any level. I mean, I'm thinking, they must not have known Paul, right? When Paul was ready to go on his second missionary journey with his dear friend Barnabas, Barnabas, the guy that introduced him to the church, that, that kind of paved the way for him when everybody was afraid that this guy who had murdered Christians is now claiming to be one, 
Barnabas thought they ought to take John Mark with them, and Paul says, no way. And based on principle, separated from his good friend Barnabas. That's not a coward. Or, when Paul was at Antioch, he didn't walk with Jesus the way that the other apostles did. He was added lately. He would later call himself the least of all the apostles. But when Peter began to waffle on fellowshipping with Gentiles there at Antioch, in Galatians 2, Paul says, I withstood him to his face because he was wrong. Nothing cowardly about that. Again, these false teachers didn't know Paul. They underestimated Paul. They thought they might be able to take advantage of him by looking at him and measuring him by their own standards, saying he's not very impressive, and we just need to point out the fact, yeah, he writes tough letters, but when he's around us in person, he's not much. Paul understood the source and purpose of his authority as an apostle. Look at verse 8 in the middle of it. He says, for even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. His authority came from Christ. It was not inherent. It was not something that he took upon himself. It was that which was vested in him by Jesus. And that authority was vested in him for building up the church, not destroying it. Now this is a vitally important point for both churches and church leaders to take note of and never forget. Christ himself is the one who gives leaders to his church. Just as he gave apostles to the church to be the foundation and establishment of the New Testament church, so today he gives elders to the church. Now elders don't have the same authority as apostles. They're, they're not apostles. But elders do have authority vested in them by Christ through the congregation to give leadership to the church. And they are to acknowledge that and to handle that, not as if there's inherent authority, that they have it personally because of what or who they are, but it's vested authority that comes to them from Christ through the church for them to be recognized to give leadership in the church. And elders are to exercise their authority for the building up of the church and not in ways that destroy it. Brothers and sisters, where this is understood and where this is being practiced well, blessings come to a congregation. Rich blessings that we might somehow, sometimes take for granted. Godly leadership being exercised in proper ways under the Lordship of Christ is designed by God to bring blessing. Listen to the way King David speaks about authority. On his deathbed, on his deathbed, last recorded words of David we have in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 2 and 3. Listen to what David says. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. And now he quotes God. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. Says, Good things happen when Godly authority is exercised in the fear of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, that's how it's supposed to operate in a church. They're supposed to be godly men set aside who recognize that they are granted authority by Christ through the church for the purpose of giving leadership. And they are to exercise that leadership in the fear of God. When that happens, a congregation is blessed. Paul understood that. So should we. And because Paul understood his relationship with Christ and the church as an, uh, an apostle with authority, he did not apologize for that authority in standing against false teachers. By doing so, he was actually serving the church and helping build it up. Though he was unashamed of his authority as an apostle, he also reminds them that the only commendation of a person's life or ministry that matters is that that comes from the Lord. In verse 12, he says, we, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So he says, I'm not going to engage in their game. 
where they talk about, well, I've accomplished this, and I've done this, and, and I have this ability, and look at how people are influenced by me, and they're just comparing themselves to one another. Paul says, I am not going there. Because it doesn't matter how much a man commends himself. What really matters is when the Lord commends a man. Paul recognized that they are without understanding when they engage in those kinds of antics. Why? Because it's not the way of Christ. You see, it's completely inconsistent to claim to be an apostle of Christ and then start engaging and comparing yourself, commending yourself, promoting yourself. The way of Christ is the way of self-denial. It's the way of suffering. It's the way of taking up a cross, dying daily. It's the way of the one who said, if you would be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to become servant of all. The last will be first. Paul says, these guys, by the way they're acting, expose themselves. They show that they really don't even understand Jesus and the way of Jesus while they're trying to position themselves as being such super apostles for Jesus. He underscores this point in verse 18 when he says, it's not the one who commends himself who's approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. These false teachers weren't interested in building up the church. They were interested in being recognized. They were interested in being given positions of influence in the church. Brothers and sisters, this raises a question. What are you doing to build up the church? Paul was focused on a local church, the one in Corinth. What are you doing to build up this church? If you're a member here and you're basically a consumer, come in, consume, leave, till the next time to consume. You ought to ask yourself the question, am, am I concerned, like Paul was concerned, to build up the church? What do I have that I can offer to the Lord in service to Christ and His church? Just prayerfully ask that question. Ask God to help you to see and think how you can engage your time, your energies, your resources, your gifts for the building up of the church. Or if you're a long-time attender here and haven't joined, have you ever stopped to consider how your lack of joining with brothers and sisters might be inhibiting the building up of the church? Why wouldn't you covenant together with other brothers and sisters under the Lordship of Christ, submitting yourself together with them to Christ in order to see Christ honored in the church built up? A faithful ministry is concerned with battling the world, with building the church. But then thirdly, in the last paragraph, it's also concerned in boasting in the Lord. Verses 13 through 18. Paul acknowledges the stewardship that we have from the Lord. Look at verse 13. He says, we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God has assigned to us to reach even to you. For we're not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come to you all the way to, first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. Paul says, God's the one who led us to Corinth to preach the gospel to you. In essence, he's saying, I'm your spiritual father. I'm the one that God chose as an instrument to bring the gospel to you that you savingly believed. These false apostles who come in, they're interlopers. They're coming in to wreak havoc among people among whom they have not labored or established anything. Now, we should not read Paul's words here as petty jealousy. He's not jealous of these super apostles, so-called because they're in Corinth. He sees the danger that they bring to the church by their spiritual ignorance and spiritual arrogance. And that's why he opposes them. He doesn't look at Corinth, the church at Corinth, as his own little pet prize that nobody else can ever participate in. Not that at all. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think it's verse 10, he talks about, he anticipates having laid the foundation as an apostle that others will come and build on that foundation. He anticipates that. But he is unwilling to stand by when interlopers come in and they're not 
at all concerned to build rightly on this foundation, but they're going to try to undermine that foundation by undermining Paul's credibility and therefore the gospel that he preached and establishing the foundation of Christ's work among the Corinthians. So, Paul is not petty. He's not being jealous here. He is explaining that God is the one who put him in an influ influential position in the life of the Corinthians. And he wants them to recognize that he speaks from that position of God's providential arrangement. He goes on to show his missionary heart by speaking of the desire that he has for even greater spheres of influence beyond Corinth. Look at verses 15 and 16. He says, we do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. He's trusting the Lord for an increase of his spiritual influence. His point is this, that he hopes that as they mature, as they stabilize, that he may extend his ministry beyond Corinth. Undoubtedly, he's thinking about the West, about Rome, and beyond Rome, about Spain. How do we know this? Because this is what he says in his letter to the church of Rome in Romans 15, verse 24, that his aspiration is to go to Spain, where Christ has never been preached, in order to make him known. But in order for this to happen, the Corinthians are going to have to reject the false teachers completely. They're going to have to return to a simple trust in Christ and the provisions that Christ has made for their church, including Paul with his apostolic authority. Paul wants to see the gospel continue to spread in places where it's not gone, and he believes that what's happening in Corinth will hinder that, but as they correct, as they rectify the problem, then the platform will be there from which even greater gospel advance can be launched. He wraps this up by saying that we should remember that all glory belongs to the Lord. He cites Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24 and just kind of summarizes that. He says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is verse 17. The point is that the Corinthians are not a prize to be fought over selfishly. He's not in, interested in defending himself because he wants glory for himself. Any good that he has done, any reason that he has for pride or boasting is because of the Lord. And therefore, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Well, that's true for all of us. Any good that we see accomplished through our efforts is because of the Lord. And as we rejoice and boast in that, we should boast in the Lord. It is what He has done. Well, these are some of the concerns of a faithful gospel ministry. To battle the world. To build the church. To boast in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this needs to be our orientation as a church. We need to see ourselves engaged in spiritual warfare and be willing to pick up, pick up the sword of the Spirit to stand against all of the influences of the world that would try to insinuate their ways of thinking and judging and valuing and loving into the life of the church and be zealous for the Word of the Lord which is the sword of the Spirit to meditate on it, be shaped by it so that we might wield it effectively. And we must be willing to take up with the other hand the trowel to build up the church, to be engaged in this effort of seeing Christ honored in a local assembly by our prayers, by our faithful participation in the lives of other believers, by our gathering together like this for worship and prayer and evangelism and ministry efforts so that Christ will be honored with our gifts, resources, time, and efforts. And we must do all of this for the glory of the Lord. So that as we boast, we will learn to boast only in Him. Because it is His work. We are His people. It is His grace that has saved us and changed us and put us on this pathway. And so in and through all of our efforts to resist the world, to build the church, we want honor and glory to come to Him. That's what a faithful ministry does. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for using him to write your word to us in 2 Corinthians. And we ask that you would help us. Oh God, help us to be sensitive to what your spirit is saying to us through this portion of your word today. Show us Christ in a way that we'll be filled with hope. Show us your glory in a way that our greatest zeal and determination would be to see your glory magnified to a world that is far from you, that knows so little of you. And use this church for that purpose. For Jesus' sake.